Welcome to Friends and Fiction, four New York Times bestselling authors, endless stories. Novelists Mary Kay Andrews, Kristen Harmel, Christy Woodson Harvey, and Patty Callahan Henry are four longtime friends with more than 70 published books between them. Together, they host Friends and Fiction with author interviews and fascinating insider talk about publishing and writing to highlight and support independent bookstores. They discuss the books they've written, the books they're reading now, and the art of storytelling. If you love books and you're curious about the writing world, you're in the right place. Hello, everyone. It is Wednesday night, time for another episode of Friends and Fiction, and it's our first show of December. We are really looking forward to tonight, so let's get started. I'm Kristen Harmel. I'm Christy Whitson Harvey. I'm Patty Callahan Henry. And I'm Mary Kay Andrews. And this is Friends and Fiction, four New York Times bestselling authors, endless stories to support independent bookstores, authors, and librarians. Tonight, we'll be talking with the incredible bestselling author, Louise Penny, whose Armand Gamache series, and I think I just said it wrong, has been made into an Amazon Prime show that just debuted last week, and whose brand new novel just debuted at the number one spot on the New York Times bestseller list today. We're so excited Yay! for her. And then later on in the after show, we'll be joined by Ray Meadows, whose new novel, Winterland, about a Soviet gymnast in the 70s, feels surprisingly relevant given what's happening in that part of the world today. It was also just chosen as a GMA buzz pick, so we are so excited to dive in with both of our wonderful authors tonight. So mm -hmm. But first, we need to raise a toast to some pretty exciting yeah. news. Ladies, get your champagne flutes out. And Sean and Meg, would you join us? There we go. Hi, guys. Hi. <laughs> Sometimes in life, not all the time, but sometimes things line up exactly the way they're meant to line up. And we think that Friends in Fiction, which we started during the early days of the pandemic as a way to help booksellers and reach readers, is one of those things. It has become so much bigger than just us, but we had no idea how big it would become. And that's why it perhaps feels so perfect to be celebrating tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to raise a glass to two major milestones, our 150th Friends in Fiction episode and the fact that we have surpassed 100,000 members of our Friends in Fiction group on Facebook. Oh, cheers. Yeah. Cheers. cheers. So excited. Cheers. Mm -hmm. It's huge. Huge. <laughs> huge. I need to make it better. And actually, I just looked and we're like already past 101,000 since you yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so it's this crazy. is a toast for all of you out there, not just us. From those who have been with us since day one to the 100,000th member who joined us just this week. We are enormously grateful to all of you. You formed a community. You've delighted over your shared love of reading. You've shared your thoughts on books and on life. And you've lifted each other up during both difficult days and happy ones. And you've done the same for all of us. Over the two and a half years we've been doing this show, each of us on the screen today has had some struggles. And during those times, it has been this group that has reminded us of the power of the literary community and the strength found in good, positive thinking, even through difficult days. So cheers to all of you, too. We are so proud of what you've helped us make friends and fiction become. Cheers, y'all. Cheers. 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 And while we're toasting, while we're toasting, let's also raise a glass to some other special news. Uh, yeah. Mary Kay Andrews, the Santa suit just hit the New York Times bestseller list in paperback. Cheers. 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 We're so excited. So exciting. <laughs> Good for you. Well, thanks, everyone. And um, we are just so thrilled. That's awesome. <laughs> so what so a night. Of and what a night indeed. So on a personal note, I think we all feel honored that our 150th episode and our celebration of 100,000 also falls when we have author Louise Penny as a guest. When we started Friends in Fiction, it was with the goal of helping. 
We were in the midst of a dark time and we just wanted to spark some light. And you'll find out in just a few minutes when Louise comes on that that's been very much her philosophy too. She say she has taken some difficult things that have happened in her own life and she's found a way to use them to do some good in the world. So as Patty said, something sometimes things line up just perfectly. So one more cheers and then um, and then we will get on cheers. with the show. <laughs> cheers. cheers. And Sean and Sean and Meg, we'll see you in a little bit. Yeah. Go backstage. And we couldn't do it without you. There's just course, no way. Exactly. No way. No way. And speaking of bringing light into the world, like Meg and Sean, we continue to encourage you to support independent booksellers when and where you can. And one way to do that is to visit our own Friends and Fiction bookshop.org page, where you can find Louise's and Ray's books and books by the four of us and all of our guests at a discount. Okay, and just one last reminder that our friends in fiction, that our friends in fiction, <laughs> so you just saying that just comes out of my mouth, also. that our friends of Indie Bookstore Oxford Exchange are offering our signature friends and fiction t-shirts, buy one, get one free. So one for you, one for a friend, an extra for laundry day, two for holiday gifts for your favorite friends and fiction members, whatever you want. So make sure to send us a picture of you wearing your t-shirt. We're going to pick two winners on our episode next week, our special holiday episode, to receive a special Friends and Fiction reading package full of books from some of our guests this season. So just go to Oxford Exchange and use the code FFBOGO, it's FFBOGO, at checkout. And of course, you know that all year long, we've been doing a Friends and Fiction reading challenge run by our friend Anissa Armstrong. Well, we're in the last month of the year, which means we've arrived at the last How prompt. How that happen? How? How? I don't know. This oh month, God. we're encouraging <laughs> you to read a holiday book. And if you've enjoyed it, tell us all about it in our Facebook group. Do you guys know anybody who has a holiday book? Mm -hmm. You guys all have holiday books. Mm -hmm. If anyone's looking for an idea... All three of these ladies, That's including crazy. the Santa suit, the New York Times bestseller. Yeah. All right. So, all right, ladies, let's introduce Louise. Louise Penny is a number one New York Times and Globe and Mail bestselling author of the Chief Inspector Armand Gamache novel. She has won many awards, including a CWA Dagger and the Agatha Award, Agatha Award which she has won five times. Wow. wow. <laughs> She was a finalist also for the Edgar Award for Best Novel. Before being published as an author, Louise was a journalist with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, or the CBC. She lives in a small village south of Montreal, close to the American border. Her new novel, A World of Curiosities, was just released on November 29th, so... Obviously, we just found out it hit New York Times, and we're <laughs> thrilled, and we're so excited to talk to her about it tonight. But that's not all we're excited about. Gosh, there's so much good stuff so tonight. Much. Like, <laughs> talk about the light in, in darkness. Um, yeah. We'd also like to announce that Louise's brand new novel, A World of Curiosities, is our December pick for the friends and fiction behind the book book club on the Fable app. That means that once you're done watching this show tonight, you can head over the app to dive into our discussion of the book led by Kristen. So Kristen will have some interview questions, some thoughts that she had about the characters, stuff that you can't get anywhere else. So you can head over to the app. And if you're not a member yet, just go to fable.co, not com, co, backslash friends and fiction to find out more. And Fable is offering a free 14-day trial so you can see how much fun it is and get hooked. We're mm -hmm. thrilled that we'll be able to talk about a world of curiosities there with you because there's so much to dive into that we can't get to all of it here. Exactly. And as we agreed with Louise backstage, being our Fable pick is pretty much equal to being it the might number one give her New York Times bestseller. I mean, same, yep. yeah, kind same, of same, 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 same. same. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Same, same. All right. So without further ado, Sean, could you bring Louise on? Hi, Hello. Louise. You know, I, I turned down. They said, now, what do you want? You want the book club or the Nobel Prize? Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> Friends in Fiction. I mean, thank friends you. You made the right choice, Louise. Really. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Some it's things last forever. You guys are just a riot. No, I just love oh, you. I don't even want. I just want to sit here and listen to the four, three. Oh, oh no, you don't. We want to listen to you. So much, but I won't say which one. 
<laughs> but Louise, we're so excited to have you. So let's begin tonight, since we all have our champagne glasses handy, to toasting a world of curiosity, which just debuted at number one on the New York Times list. So oh cheers, Louise. We're thrilled for you. Thank you. No, I, it, it, it's, it is an... Uh, but you know, I mean, who, who thinks that's ever going to happen? Right. Oh, you don't dare dream. You dream that maybe the book will be published, but you don't dare dream that we'll even make the list. Never mind. Number Sit one. On so I'm, I'm, I'm overjoyed. You're Aren't an inspiration, we? Louise. You are. You are. Incredible. Incredible. We're just yeah. so happy for you. All right, Thanks. Louise, can you start off tonight by telling us, first of all, what a world of curiosities is about, but also, we also love to ask, what is the book really about? Ah, uh, you know, I, 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 you'd think I would know. <laughs> <laughs> my, my problem is that it's actually about a number of things. I mean, it's clearly, it's, it's, I'm going to assume people listening, uh, there are a number who, who don't know my book. So they're, they're crime fiction um, and, and very happy to be crime fiction because crime fiction you know, allows for all sorts of explorations. It's really the, the, the Trojan horse, the crime, that allows me and other authors to explore the human condition. So mm. it's not really about the murder. The murder is the catalyst, and it becomes about all sorts of other things. And this is, uh, they're set, let me give you some broad strokes. It's set in um, Quebec, in um a village that I created called Three Pines doesn't doesn't really exist, but it's inspired by a bunch of um, sort of imaginary villages and other ones that I've seen that I've visited. Um, it's got uh, the same. This is book eighteen in the series. Uh, as you said, Chief Inspector Gamash is the is one of the main characters, but there really is this this cadre, this this group of friends, you know, like you. You know the group of people, villagers who become friends, and and so while they are crime novels, they're really about the whole series is really about um, belonging. It's about mm, friendship, like about our our profound yearning to connect with other human beings, and and that's really what the 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 books are about. They're 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 inspired by a couple of lines from Auden. And his the poem he wrote for Melville, um, and I'm actually I think I'm wearing the Nantucket. I am. Yeah. Um, where he wrote, "Goodness existed, that was the new knowledge. His terror had to blow itself quite out to let him see it." So the books in this one is about terror, but really at its heart, at its core, it's about goodness. Wow. Oh, I have chill bumps. I love That's amazing. That. I have chill bumps. It's so hard to define our books. Yeah. Um, that's why I like what, what's it really about? Because yeah. the, the crime might be the spine, yeah. but what you just said lets us know so much more than what the plot is. It's beautiful. Yeah. So there's so much to dig into here, but since A World of Curiosities is the latest in the Three Pine series, I want to start by talking about kind of the origin. It's one of our favorite subjects with your main character, Armand Gamache, a man of compassion, intelligence, and keen perspective. I know you say on your website that your inspiration for this character was very personal. Can you talk to us about him and who inspired him, who inspired you to create him? Right, well, there's a lot, again, in that question to unpack. Yeah. What, the, the, I, I, the book was made possible because my my husband Michael, um, I, as you said, I was a journalist, and I was just I was burned out. I had just yeah. you know, covered too much politics, too much negative stories, too many accidents, too many tragedies, but mostly Quebec politics. And I, you know, I, I hesitate to admit that you know, talking to Americans that Quebec politics brought me to my knees. So you can imagine, yeah, right. <laughs> that's a little yeah. embarrassing, yeah. Uh, but it did, it did. It just, I had had enough. And Michael said, God bless him. He said, if you want to quit in order to write that book that you've always wanted to, he said, I'll support you. Oh, and, wow. he did. and that's, that's what um, made it possible for me to, to be writing. And I know how lucky I am because most writers don't have that grace. Most writers are, 
raising children and going to jobs and doing all sorts of things and f stealing five minutes here, 10 minutes there. And, and I was very, very fortunate to be able to focus on the writing. Um, but the main, the main character, Gamash, well, first of all, I thought, I thought I wouldn't be published. So I thought the only reward I'm going to get is the, the writing of it. So I would have to really, really enjoy the writing of it because nothing else is going to come my way. So I created this village I would choose to live in. I populated it with people whose company I would enjoy for the year or two it would take to write. And then the main character, and I thought, now how am I, if it does get published and it is turned into a series, which is of course the dream, how am I not going to tire of the guy? So I oh. thought, I, I will create a man I would marry. And I thought, oh, oh I smart. <laughs> wow. Ever. And then I went down to, to the kitchen table one morning and, and, you know, prattling away about, I don't know, the dry cleaner or something. And, and Michael starts talking about world peace. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, I didn't create Gamash. I transcribed him. <laughs> oh, wow, wow. I have no imagination, no imagination. It's, it's, I just I write what I see, and Gamash is inspired by by Michael, who was yeah. the happiest man I have ever oh. known. Happiest, mm. content, joyous, even wow. his favorite saying, um, and I have it out in the garden. I, I actually put it in, in many of the books. Was um, C.S. Lewis's um, um, "Surprised by Joy," um, um, and he was the doctor. He was a doctor, and he was the doctor you never want to meet. And he had a lot in common with Gamash in that because Michael saw so much death, he was a pediatric hematologist. Oh, so he dealt with oh, wow. children who had terrible illnesses. He had to tell parents things no parent should ever have to hear. Right. He sat by the children's beds into the night and through the night. And, but he came home and he was, he was happy and not because the death obviously made him happy. They didn't. It was devastating. But what he learned from those children who did not get to brush gray from their eyes was what a gift life is wow. and how dare those of us who do get to live it, not live it with gratitude, with joy, with bravery, um, with an awareness of how lucky we are. And so Michael taught me that and I imbued Gamash with the same qualities. Mm. He sees death all the time, but he also sees goodness and, and he is aware of how lucky he is. Oh, I love oh Louise. That. Beautiful. Oh my goodness. Wow. I was a pediatric nurse back oh, in no. my early days. And so I'm thinking I had to stop when I when I had three young kids. So because, of the, because it was too emotional or it was or? too much. Well, that, and I had three kids under five, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but I'm thinking if I had known a pediatrician like him, what mm -hmm. a difference in the world, Louise, that's beautiful. Yeah. I, I think, think, go ahead, Kathy, go ahead. I was just thinking that um, it's interesting that Gamash has a um, happy, successful marriage, which yeah. not a lot of police, detectives do well certainly not fictional ones you know yeah. in real life in real life a lot of them don't either yeah well our, our mayor here who used to be the head of the sauté detachment has a very long term you know frankly i haven't met that many cops who aren't married and and you know if, if they're married i think they've figured out how to to, mm -hmm. to navigate yeah. that and, mm -hmm. and how, how much to talk about how much to keep yeah. private and of probably in therapy. I mean, I'm a big yeah. believer in therapy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, Surprised by Joy, No One Here is Surprised, is one of my favorite books in the world. I, no, is that right? Oh, yeah. Well, I wrote a novel about C.S. Lewis's wife. Oh. So she, that book is kind of read it one too many times. Not that you've read it too many times. So I think there's some of you in Gamash, too. I see this connection between your choices and your character's choices in this. You have taken something tragic and decided to do something good with it. You're a spokesperson for the Federation of Quebec Alzheimer's Societies, and you've been a 
very vocal about what it's like to care for a loved one suffering from dementia. And then Gamash has folded a young woman, woman named Fiona into his life and into his family. Can you talk about the decision to not only share a very personal piece of yourself to help others, but then also having Gamash do the same thing by sharing a personal piece of himself to help Fiona? That's a, such an interesting question. I mean, I know I'm, I'm where I am, both as a writer, but also as a human being, because uh, other people helped me. You know, they reached wow. down and, and pulled me up when I needed it. Um, they kept me company when I needed company. And so again, how I, it would be impossible not to try to do the same thing for others. Um, but w what you're referring to, of course, for the most part is that Michael uh, developed dementia um, and died in 2016. So that was six years ago. Uh, but when he was first diagnosed, we talked about it, of course, and and it was his courage. He was the one who said, we need to talk about this, wow. not just among ourselves and the family and whatnot, but but publicly, because I am not ashamed. This oh, wow. Of. So let's just, and, and I promised him he would never be left behind. He would never be left out, and he wasn't. So, you know, he, he came to parties. He Even when things got really bad, he was still welcomed at parties and if he wasn't welcome then neither was I so wow. we just, and 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 you know I think people take our cue take their cues from us yes you know? and, and so we tried to be warm and open and honest and and find the humor in it because sometimes you know the beauty of dementia not always because often it's just tragic but yeah there is a clarity about it all the other wow. stuff falls away and what's important is that the person is safe and healthy Healthy yeah. and, if possible, happy. Nothing yeah. else matters. Yeah. That, that makes life actually quite easy. Um, and, yeah, in terms of Gamash believes, and always has, not only in this book, but he's been, he believes very strongly in being a mentor uh, oh. for, for others, for, for young agents. In this particular book, um, it's a young woman who he feels has gotten a number of rotten deals mm -hmm. and, and, and wants to help folds her into the family, yeah. sometimes for better, sometimes for worse. It's not always good. Jean Guy, his second in command, is always warning him that he has a blind spot. And one day mm -hmm. something awful is going to come out of that blind spot. And in this book is the day it happens. Mm -hmm. Our greatest strengths sometimes end up as a weakness. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. The things we, 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 we don't see. Yep. Yeah, that, and that's, that's inspired by the a couple of lines, again, from Auden, from his poem, um, The Secret is Out. And what, a couple of the lines are, there's always another story, there's more than meets the eye. And mm -hmm. that inspired this book, because what happens when you don't see the other story, mm -hmm. when you miss yeah. what else is out there? I love well, that. Speaking of Gamash, let's talk about the exciting news of the television series based on the books, Three Pines, which stars Alfred Molina and debuted, it, debuted just five days ago on Amazon Prime. I am saving it for my binge watch. A holiday <laughs> binge watch. <Yeah. laughs> it's so exciting and what an incredible cast. Can you talk to us about what the experience has been like and what it's been like to see Gamash come to life in Alfred Molina's capable hands? Well, the first part of the question, it was awful. <laughs> it was watching <laughs> Oh my God! I knew that for two years, <laughs> God, I, I tried to, you know. First of all, I wanted to see how many free lunches I could get out of them. <laughs> Make up my mind. Um, but I had I had had an experience where where a company, obviously I gave them permission, had turned my first book into a made for TV movie, and it was not a happy experience. So I I decided after that that no more. So I turned down every every offer and then Left Bank, who does The Crown, came oh, and gosh. said, we're interested. Um, so, you know, it's hard to say no to something like that. Yeah. But yeah. it's hard to say, you know, to close the door. So that's why I met with Andy Harry's the head for a, a number of years, because it's about trust. You know, yeah. no matter yeah. what the contract says, finally, on, honestly, they're going to do what they're going to do. Yeah. So you have to trust them. Um, 
And finally, I decided if I'm ever going to do it, I am never going to find a better company than this. Yeah. So let's mm. just, in Quebec, we have a phrase called le beau risque, which is obvious, you know, the big, the big risk, the, yeah. the leap. And so I took the leap and, and it was still awful. I was actually, I was actually, because they sent, I was one of the executive producers. And so they, which means I had meaningful consultation. Turns out that is a sliding scale. <laughs> it's it's exactly. Away from me. <laughs> Their flavor. <laughs> it's also a little bit like being the queen of England. I often thought because, you know, people are really nice to you. But they don't really want to hear what your opinion is. About <laughs> and, and you're, just you're, nod you're, and hold your purse. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> just, that's exactly it. Yeah, <laughs> smile, wave, but yeah, don't open your mouth. Oh, great. But I'm <laughs> my mouth. And th I mean, there were meetings. You won't believe this. I mean, we're, we're, we're five strong, thoughtful women who've been through quite a lot in life. I was in meetings and in tears. I have never oh, wow. been in tears in a business meeting in my life, oh, but this reduced gosh. me to tears. Because oh, wow. as you as you probably gathered, these books aren't, you know, cash cows. I don't yeah. churn them out. They are grounded in something fundamental to me. Yeah. And I felt I owed the characters protection, and I felt like I was not doing a good job. Oh. Um, so it was very painful. It was painful for them too, you know, because they had someone who was fighting back, um, I think in their opinion, inappropriately. And in some cases they were right about it being inappropriate. I mean, not, not that I was inappropriate, but I think there were many cases where they actually were right and I was wrong. Um, and it was a learning process. Wow. Um, so finally, but finally, when they said, uh, we got the scripts to a stage where I thought, okay, you know. Um, and then they said, because my, my big fear and something that they could never recover from would be miscasting Gamash. Yes, you know? definitely. Yeah. So I was afraid they were going to go with, you know, Maggie Smith or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and when uh, Andy Harris called up and said, Alfred Molina, and they didn't have him yet. But he said, Alfred Molina. And I knew then that it got, if we could get Molina, everything oh, would change. Yeah. And it did. They got him. Oh, how great. He's, and he is superb. Not just good. He is superb. And the nicest man, oh, which helps. Because you don't awesome. want your hero to be played by a piece of merd. Uh -uh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, Gamash oh. demands <laughs> certain gravitas. <laughs> I he has to have gravitas. Yeah. Um, I've read an interview, Louise, in which you talk about how murders can be both fun and therapeutic to write. And since I do that in almost every book, I agree. I love the phrase you use to describe that feeling. You said they're like origami with blood. <laughs> Did I say that? <laughs> it appears so. Are you sure that wasn't Colleen Hoover? <laughs> <laughs> I think she would talk about a different bodily... <laughs> <laughs> okay, can you talk to us about that feeling of creating these <laughs> twisty mysteries and choosing not to shy away from the dark? Because, you know, when you first open um, a Three Pines book, you see this idyllic Canadian village of snow and trees, and there's an old lady with a duck, and there's innkeepers, and it's so idyllic. And <laughs> the lady with a duck. The lady with a duck. <laughs> And then things go dark. How does then that happen? Things go dark. Yeah. Uh, does that happen to you very often, Mary Kay? Things suddenly go dark. Yeah. <laughs> it does. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, the books, again, you, we talked about what are they What are they about? And they, the, the, one of the things that goes through them is the duality. You know, wow. I was a journalist and a murder in a big city, while always tragic, is not a surprise. Yeah. A murder in a village is shattering. Yeah. Because because you know the victim and there's a pretty good chance you know who did it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's what I want. I mean, what is worse than the serpent in, in, in Paris? Yeah. You know, a serpent in a, in a, you know, a serpent's nest isn't so bad. Serpent <laughs> in paradise is pretty bad. So that's what I like to explore, the light and the dark. 
Um, and it's, it's just very important. And the, the duality, the, the difference between what we say and what we're actually thinking, between the, the visage, the, the outer face and the inner turmoil, <laughs> that, that, that chasm that exists. Um, and that's what I find fascinating. And I never, ever, one is the thing that's really important to me is that the murder is never trivialized. There's no sense of, oh, well, you know, no. you know, good old, you know, Ruth, you know, she was a, she was a good egg. Oh, well, let's get on and have fun solving <laughs> the murder. No, it's, yeah. it's not fun. And, and the crime isn't fun. The, the repercussions go on from book to book. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's somewhat rooted in the journalism as well and seeing and, and talking to victims. And, and in this particular book, I, I talk about the murders at the Ecole Polytechnique, the murders of 14 women, clearly a femicide, yes. which happened. Wow. And, you know, talk to one of the women who survived. She was shot four times. Oh, wow. Wow. You know, you do that, you don't, you tend not to come out the other side laughing at, at yeah. violence. Right. Or trivializing yeah. it, like you said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's so true. Well, you, you do such a great job of striking that balance. Um, and, and so does Gamash. I, I mean, he, um, he thinks so much about the victims and their families and their impact. I, I just, it's just so beautifully done. Um, we also wanted to ask you about your collaboration with Hillary Clinton on last year's State of Terror. Now, we generally stay away from talking about politics on this show, so I think it's really important to say this. Your original interaction with Secretary Clinton had absolutely nothing to do with politics. It's a story about one human being reaching out to another human being and that becoming the beginning of a beautiful friendship. So can you tell us a little bit about how you and Secretary Clinton connected and well, how that connection turned into a writing partnership? Yeah, and that's really an, an important thing. I mean, she and I almost yeah. never talk about politics. She doesn't need to come to me to talk about, you know. <laughs> yeah, her. she probably has some people for that. <laughs> yeah, she has other people for that. And, and frankly, I'm not, a, I'm not a yob. I'm not a political animal. Um, so we, we give each other something else that's missing in, in each of our lives. But, but you're right. Um, I, I found out through an interview that her best friend gave that, that they are, she reads my books and, and enjoys the books. So mm -hmm. I managed to meet her best friend. This was in 2016, um, you know, in the, in the height of the political campaign. Uh, but I hadn't met her, and, but I was thrilled that she reads the books, of course. Yeah. Um, and then, um, in, in September of, of that year, again, just before the election itself, Michael passed away. Um, and I was, you know, obviously devastated. And I was reading the, the, so many people wrote cards of condolence and among them was one from Hillary Clinton. But she, and she wasn't like dear occupant, sorry for your loss, you know, to whom it may concern. Dear occupant, to whom it may concern. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was, you know, dear Louise, and, you know, I, 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 I know about Michael's career and, and that he was a, a lead investigator into pediatric oncology and, and all that he contributed and the first named chair in Canada in, in pediatric oncology. And so, I mean, she really drilled down on him. She'd never met him. She'd never met me. Wow. I'm a Canadian. I can't even vote. And she, <laughs> wrote a, she took time in the heat of this campaign to write a personal note, reaching out to another woman who, you know, who was clearly hurting. And it was an act of kindness that, yeah. that I will never forget. Um, and then after she, she uh, lost the election, um, we finally did meet. It was terrifying. She <laughs> and Betsy, the best friends, got in touch. By then, she and I were friends, but I still hadn't met Hillary. And Betsy phoned up one day and said, Hillary would like us to come to Chappaqua. For, for a night. Do you want, are you up for it? Well, who's going to say no? Right. I don't, me. don't think so. Uh, but at the same time, I thought, uh oh, now she's going to know I'm a complete idiot, right? So, I mean, I'm going to hold myself together for like 24 hours. I can probably do that. You know, you smile, you nod, you laugh when she laughs, you look sad when she looks sad. It's like speaking <laughs> a different language. <laughs> then Betsy called up and said, no, actually, actually, now she wants it two nights. I thought, I'm. Like, I'm doomed. I can, you know, I can hold it together. I can pretend for one night, but two nights I'm doomed. Um, but you know, it, it, to your point at, at the beginning, it, it, we just met as two women of a similar age who had been shattered. Yeah. And 
she needed nothing from me and I needed nothing from her except friendship. I love and, that. And that's still our relationship. Wow, that's incredible. Do you think that that influenced the way you wrote together, that you came, that you came to this friendship, both of you from kind of a place of... Um, of loss. I, I mean, of, of life not quite turning out the way you wanted. I, I know there were personal losses in, in both of your lives. Um, do you think that that influenced the writing of the book at all? I think it did. I think it certainly approached our ability or, or influenced our ability to write the book, for sure. Yeah. And, and our ability to really be honest with each other about... Yeah about the subtexts that we wanted to bring in because it's, it's meant to be a really a fun, wide ranging thriller and action. And, um, but there are other, you know, issues about friendship, profound issues about, about women friends. This is a, this is in many ways a love story. It's a buddy movie, a buddy story between yeah. Ellen and her best friend, Betsy. By then Hillary's best friend, Betsy had passed away. She had died oh, of wow. breast cancer. And so we wanted to put mm. Betsy in as a homage. Oh, no. um, so I think that there were, uh, that maybe no one else would pick up on, but I think it's unusual as a thriller because it is also very character driven. And mm. I think our friendship allowed us to do that. Oh, I love that. Mm -hmm. And also uh, we would, we would, this was during the pandemic. So we could, you know, and in the, as you, as you, you know, you started this in the pandemic, a lot of yeah. things start in the pandemic when you have time and you have the yeah. space and you can breathe. Um, a little bit more room. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. And it would not have, it would really wouldn't have happened. I think outside yeah. of the pandemic, um, but we would FaceTime each other at like 7 PM and we'd both be in bed. It was so pathetic. <laughs> bed at seven o'clock. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I'd be in my, my moose pajamas, which she never failed to mock me. <laughs> That's great. Oh, so awesome. Friends are four. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now we all need moose jammies. Exactly. Yeah. It sounds wonderful. Final, final moose pajamas. Oh, yeah. What other kind are there? No. Really? I don't think yeah. there's cotton moose jammies. No, yeah. it's just wrong. That's just wrong. That's wrong. Well, Louise, we usually ask writers who come on the show for a writing tip. Um, but first, I really want to ask you about your journey to publication. You obviously are a worldwide household name now, but two decades ago, you'd been struggling to write a book since quitting your job as a CBC journalist five years earlier, and it wasn't really working out. So can you talk a bit about what changed and how you came to writing mysteries instead of working in another genre? Yeah, thank you for bringing up the failure for five years. <laughs> you know, it makes us feel better. That's all. Us, it was well, selfish. And I do think that there's this um, <laughs> this perception, you know, when there are writers out here who are watching the show and they're like, oh, everyone here is an overnight success. Yeah. You know? And that's right. not necessarily. Well, I thought that. And I think that was part of what what why I suffered from yeah. writer's block is that I thought I had to get it right yes. immediately. Yeah. And that every word had to be, and it was par literally paralyzing. Paralyzing. I, yeah. I, yeah. I wrote nothing. Uh, you know, it's not like I was writing and not really happy and we're throwing things away. I just, I couldn't even approach the, wow. um, the laptop. Um, yeah. And it was very, very sad for me. What happened was, I, I, like, as a journalist, I covered, you know, some tragic events and they appear to happen out of the blue but they never do of course it's it's a it's a little parade of smaller often apparently unconnected events yeah. um and the same with wonderful things that have happened in my life it's, it's this cascade of smaller things and um one of them was that we moved out of uh, montreal into this small smaller village um i also found myself invited into the company of this group of women who called themselves lay girls and we'd get together, you know, once, once, once a month, sometimes more often. And they'd talk about the process. And these were poets and, and visual artists and dancers and, and writers and uh, musicians. So the, the, the creativity came out in different ways, but the taproot was the same. Um, and, and that's what I needed. I needed to be inspired by these women who, 
we're all afraid of failing. Yeah. But they did it. As I grow older, I realize that the key in my life anyway isn't less fear because I'm always going to have certain fears. It's more courage. Yeah. And they had courage and they had courage to just, just go for it. And I saw great successes and I saw some things that really were not successes. Yeah. But it didn't kill them. And what was yeah. killing me was not trying, was being so afraid of failing that I wasn't doing the one thing I thought I was put on earth to do. Um, so that was that was vital to be in this company of, of very brave women. Um, and the last thing was looking on my bedside table and there were fiction, nonfiction books, all sorts of just a huge variety, like most of us read. But very well represented was crime fiction. And I had one of those moments of clarity where I just thought, I, I realized what a tyranny the approval of others has been in my life. And I had to let that go. I want you to say that. Write a book just for me, just yeah. for me and not worry about what anyone else thought. And so I went right down and drew three pines. And the first thing I created was the bookstore. Oh. And, uh, after that was the bistro, of course. And then <laughs> Um, yeah, and, and these these people I would choose as friends, and, and the main character I would and, and did marry. And every choice I made was selfish, because I also realized, and this was a great grace, that I am no different than anyone else. If I like something, other people will probably like it. If I dislike it, there are lots who also dislike it. Yeah. I am right in the middle of the bell curve. Nothing extraordinary about me. No, I well, that. I think we, we would beg to that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're talking um, to the wrong ladies if you want to agree talking. about that, yeah. right? Um, okay, so just piggybacking off of that, what advice would you give to someone who's in your shoes, who's struggling to write a first novel and, and doesn't really know and feels stuck? You know, what's your advice for that person? Well, you know, I would say write, write for yourself. Don't, don't write for the market. Don't worry about anything. Just write a novel. Write a book you would read. That's it. But at the same time, I do want to throw in that when it came time to write the second, because I thought the first book was magic. I had no idea how it happened. Yeah. And then my agent, who was British, and so obviously speaks with a British, and when anyone speaks to me, maybe because I'm Canadian, with a British accent, I hear an implied, you idiot. <laughs> <laughs> so every time she called I go, oh my god it's Teresa so she called up and she said I have sold three books and I said oh god that's fantastic Teresa mine and who else's <laughs> you, you idiot they're all yours and you have to write the second book within a year what took me 45 years to write the first one <laughs> I was terrified and having already had the experience of writer's block I I I was being handed everything I'd ever wanted and I was afraid of losing it. So I went to therapy. I went to a therapist and she said something that changed my life. It changed my life, not as a, simply as a writer, but as a, as a human being, she said, and I pass this along for what it's worth to emerging writers. Uh, she said, the wrong person is writing the book. She said, your critic is writing the book. <sighs> Thank the critic. You need to bless the critic. You need to show the critic the door. Don't <laughs> lock. Don't piss her off. Don't, don't be mean to the critic. Don't lock the door because you're going to need her later. But your, your creative soul, your, you know, just with freedom, you need to write. You don't need to worry about, you're never going to get it right the first time, nor should you. If you write 10 pages on a, on a pen, it's not going to end up in the final draft. Just write with gratitude, with awareness that, you have food in the in the fridge and a roof over your head and no one's trying to kill you. How lucky you are, just right. And and that you know was extraordinary. So so now that's what I do. The first draft, I just write. I just write with with, with joy. Oh, that's great advice. Oh, I love that so much. If you've gotten well, a master class tonight. <laughs> 
Yes, no kidding. I feel Oops. so filled up. Well, you you guys don't need it. You guys are the inspiration. Oh, yes, we do. <laughs> we do. We need it. Believe me. Need it. I do. Yes, I'll speak for myself. I do. Same, same, same. Exactly. <laughs> Louise, I want to share a couple quick comments with you. Jane Abel, who I suspect Mary Kay knows, says, Mary Kay Andrews introduced me to Louise Penny many years ago. Oh. My husband and I share the joy of listening to the audio versions of these fabulous stories. Um, and we also have a couple of other great comments. Claudia Dursa says, says such a wonderful thought-provoking and interesting discussion and Narina Field says loving this open and inspirational episode Louise you are mesmerizing and we are captivated so I think we agree we We agree with Narina there yes well I know I'm among friends you know I I know no it's it's important you know I think we've all done zooms or podcasts or interviews where you're not really feeling comfortable but i i yeah. feel comfortable with all of you and that's that's a great gift so thank you thanks for saying that well we we you feel like one of us immediately so we all yeah. feel very comfortable with you too i'm, I'm so glad the, so glad we know you now yeah. so louise if you would not mind sticking around for just one more minute we have more to talk about with you and then of course we'll be welcoming a novelist ray meadows to the after show But meanwhile, just a couple quick announcements. We have big news about our releases next year. All four of us have 2023 novels and we'll be doing at least five live and in-person friends and fiction events. So keep your eye out for those. We'll be in Columbus, Ohio on April 26th. The Friends and Fiction Live launch event for Patty's The Secret Book of Flora Leah is set for May 1st in Charleston and tickets are available now. It'll be a big Friends and Fiction party with a full Charleston experience that you will not want to miss. We'll have three more live events after that, one in June for my launch, one in July for Christie's launch, and another in the fall for Mary Kay's 2023 Christmas book. So more details to come soon. What? Yeah. <laughs> You're up, baby. You're up, You're up. I'm up. <laughs> now, what am I supposed to say? I'm lost. <laughs> I'm going to be MKA. We also you can- want to remind you to listen to our Writer's Block <laughs> podcast with all of us and our beloved librarian pal, Ron Block. We'll always post links under announcements each Friday when the new one drops. And on the most recent episode, Ron, Patty, and Mary Kay talk to writing coach John Truby about his newest book, The Anatomy of Genres. Coming this Friday, we'll have a back by popular demand replay of Ron's in-depth conversation with Bonnie Garmus about lessons in chemistry. One of my favorite books ever, you guys, seriously, which Barnes & Noble recently announced was their book of the year. You can find the Friends and Fiction Writer's Block podcast wherever you get your podcasts, and all of the links are available at friendsandfiction.com. You can find all of our back episodes available for listening there, too. So if you have a long drive ahead of you for the holidays, you're wrapping gifts, cleaning your house, or you just want a bit more insight into the world behind your favorite <laughs> books, all you have to do is hit play. What is Mary? Mary, you okay? Mary? Hello. Hello. Okay, I have a cold, and I'm on cold meds, and that's <laughs> no excuse. No, it's good. Do you want to be me? Do you want to do my announcement? <laughs> no, uh, no. Okay. <laughs> Friends in fiction. I, I think my champagne might have been. A- <laughs> Subscription <laughs> is available now from the indie bookstore Book Town with an E on the end in Manasquan, New Jersey. And of course, you know about this first edition subscription and club because it features signed hardback first editions from each of us during 2023. And you get a Friends in Fiction kitchen towel that says dinner can wait. It's time for Friends in Fiction, which is adorable. <laughs> and if you order before December 15th, you also get that adorable snowman Friends and Fiction Christmas ornament that you can see right there. And it will be shipped um, with, the, with a holiday card that you can share with people. So mm-hmm. if you are like panic, oh my gosh, I haven't done my gifts yet. Boom. There we you go. We got you covered. <laughs> exactly. And of course. Don't forget about the Zibby Award-winning Friends and Fiction Official Book Club with Brenda and Lisa, run by our friends Lisa Harrison and Brenda Gardner, other known, otherwise known as PB and J. They have regular happy hours with our Writer's Block podcast host Ron Block and keep everyone in the loop about suggested reads and upcoming releases. So join them tomorrow, December eighth at seven thirty for a happy hour with Ron Block and special guest newly. Freshly reminted <laughs> New York Times bestselling author Mary Kay Andrews. And their next monthly book the club discussion is on Monday, 1219, with our lovely Patty and the perfect love song. 
All right, so we have one more question for Louise, but don't forget that we're hanging around for an after show with Ray Meadows, who will be talking about her new novel, Winterland, which is about a Soviet gymnast in the 1970s. I blurbed it. I loved it. It's such a great book. But first, Louise, one question we always like to ask is this. What were the values around reading and writing in your family when you were growing up? Oh, that's an interesting question. It was definitely the major um, element in my family. I mean, it, I guess music was as well, but we there was always a lot of reading happening in, in the family. And the, I still remember coming up the stairs and my mother coming out of the bedroom and, and handing me the first adult book that 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 I would read. It was an Agatha Christie, actually. Oh wow! It was still, it was still warm from her hands, and she she looked at me, and I can't, I don't know how old I was, maybe eleven, ten, or eleven, and she looked at me and she said, "I think you might like reading oh, this." Wow. And I still remember taking it, and it warm from her hands, and it just felt, it felt like crossing some sort of membrane. Oh, wow. And then later in life, what was so important was, you know, mothers and daughters don't always get along. And we certainly oh, had really fraught. I know, <laughs> Shock. <laughs> shocking. Um, but whenever my mother and I were on the verge of saying something that could never be taken back, um, and that happened fairly often, one or the other of us would always say, "What are you reading?" Oh, and that, wow. was, that was the flag. That was the common ground. We could always find common ground find peace when we talked about Freaking books. it's like that. she's making this stuff up i know <laughs> it's so good this is amazing oh louise i oh wish we goodness. could I, I wish we could keep you for hours i mean we did we did say midnight or one right is that is yeah. that still good well, i you? love you guys i'm not leaving i'm sorry i'm gonna be here with her ray because i want to hear and chat with her and you yeah. are welcome to hang out yes <laughs> Louise, we are so excited for you about this book, about the new TV series, about the New York Times bestseller list tonight. Um, you know, it, it's, it is such a joy to see good things happen to good people. And I know yes. that's what we're witnessing right now. You've worked really hard. You're obviously a really kind, good, decent human being who's done such a good job of paying it forward. And, um, you know, we're honored that you chose us over the Nobel Prize, which is obvious. I mean, it's, it was an obvious choice, but what? you know, thank yeah. you. No, but but <laughs> seriously, Louise, we, it was it was such a joy to chat with you tonight. Thank you. It thank was, you. It was really just, inspiring. Well, I love your company. You 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 thank all you. you've the four of you are, are remarkable, and you do so much for authors and for literacy and for reading. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm really very proud to be part of this tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank well, we'll you. do it again thank soon, Louise. Thank you so much. It was so so good to see you. Congratulations thank you. again. Take care. All right, everyone out there, you can find all of our back episodes on YouTube. We are live there every week, just like we are on Facebook. And if you subscribe, you won't miss a thing. So be sure to come back right here next week for our Christmas special with Debbie McCumber and Wade Rouse, which is also our last show of the winter season. So or our fall season, whatever season we're in, whatever season this is, I've lost all track our of time. Season. Our last show of 2022. All right. So see you in about 30 seconds and you don't want to leave because this is going to be amazing. See you in 30 seconds for our after show with Ray Meadows. Thank you, Thank for, you tuning for tuning in. in. You can join us every week on Facebook or YouTube where our live show airs on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Also subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Instagram. We're so glad you're here. Oh, that was fantastic. So everyone out there, um, Patty had to leave. Uh, she had a prior commitment, so she couldn't stick around for the after show. I know she wished that she could, but um, we are thrilled to be here. And ladies, was that not, I mean, it was just such a nice show. I just felt like oh it was- Oh my gosh, Wow. It's just joy and warmth and all these nuggets of wisdom. It just and talk about thing. talk about kismet. I mean, the fact that she happened to be our guest when we happened to have our 150th episode and our hundred thousand followers, and there's so much yeah. to celebrate. It was incredible. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I I um 
Gosh, I, I've already, Meg, let's put it on the agenda for the next meeting. We're talking about when we can have her back again, because I really, really enjoyed that chat. All right. I know that Ray Meadows is patiently waiting backstage. So let's, um, let's introduce our next guest. Ray Meadows is the author of five novels. I was going to say that. It's Patty's <laughs> line. I, you know, go, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, uh, you're right. I'm right. You're right. <laughs> Cold medicine. It's cold medicine, y'all. I have not had a I, I understand. When I have cold medicine, I feel like my yeah. head is not a part of my body anymore. I'm like floating around yep. in space. <laughs> yeah, you're actually doing admirably. Considering yeah, the sometimes cold. it's you're worse a great than like, job. cold. I'm like, oh. It is. It is. Exactly. So Ray Meadows is the author of five novels, including I Will Send Rain and Calling Out. She's the recipient of the 2019 Goldenberg Prize for Fiction, the 2018 Hackney Literary Award for the novel, and a finalist for the 2018 Manchester Fiction Prize. Ray's work has appeared in numerous literary journals and online at NPR, Lit Hub, and Penn Center USA. She received a BA in art history from Stanford University and an MFA in creative, creative writing from the University of Utah. She lives with her family in Brooklyn, New York, and her new novel, Winterland, was just released on November 29th. Sean, can you please bring Ray out? Hi! <laughs> oh my gosh, I can't tell you how I've been waiting for this forever. I'm so excited to meet you oh, all. And you're so excited. So thrilled. Oh, and how magnificent was Louise Penny. Oh, she'd be so amazing. Amazing. Oh, just like inspiring. Amazing. Yeah, I, that was really I fun. I feel the same, but it's speaking of inspiring and amazing. Ray, first of all, congratulations on Winterland, which Thank I you. loved. You know Thank how much you, I loved this book. I know you've been so kind. And you all, I will say, I just echo something that Louise said. You, you're so generous to writers and to independent bookstores. And I just, it, it, warms my heart really it's just amazing so thank you thank you oh thank my you. gosh between you and louise we're gonna all walk away with no. an inflated <laughs> sense of ourselves tonight i know exactly As you <laughs> sean just popped it out but we've all been talking about this cover right like when oh, you saw this cover thank you. did you yes. just drop your teeth Yes. And you know what? It was such a, I, I know you all have been through this. Do you like that but... expression? I just used struck. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there were a lot of ugly ducklings on the way to this one. Oh, so I was wow. thrilled when they just <laughs> scrapped good. everything and came back with this. Cause I love it. And I think it captures a lot, even though my daughter who's a gymnast was like, why does she have boobs? Ray, um, for those people who haven't read the book yet, can you tell us a little bit about what Winterland is about? Yes. But also, we also always follow that question up with this question. What is it really about? Yes, I love that question. Um, <laughs> so it begins in 1970 when a former ballerina disappears from an Arctic town on the far edge of the Soviet Union. And then a few years later, her young daughter, Anya, is chosen for the grueling state system in gymnastics. And her, uh, Anya's confidant is an older woman who lives in her building who spent 10 years in the gulag camps and may hold the secret to her mother's disappearance. So as Anya grow, goes ever higher and higher uh, toward the Soviet national team, she learns that there is very little margin of error for anyone. So I think it's a, I would say it's a story about glory and loss and finding light uh, in a place where there's very little. But I would say also what it's really about, I think for me, um, and you probably feel the same way since you all are, you do the, are incredible writers and, and curious about things, but I'm always uh, interested in the extraordinary lives of people behind the ordinary lives. I think all of us have these moments in life that are, that are, um, maybe larger than our regular life. And, and I think for the character of Anya, it's about how to reconcile all these parts of her life, both the darkness and the highs and the past and the future and forging an identity in a system that really allows for very little self-differentiation. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. You know, I've read, um, Ray, that you are in training as an adult gymnast. <laughs> I am. It's my midlife obsession. I love I it. went back to gymnastics in my 40s. And it is 
I find so much joy in it and I love it. There is nothing like getting better at something at this age. So I do it. I do it three times a week. I'm really obsessed with it. It's fun. That's incredible. I can't even do a cartwheel. So like (laughs) that is just mind boggling. Oh my God. I will tell you the first time I went back, I couldn't make it through the warm up. I almost passed out. So it does take a take a while to kind of get back into it. <laughs> That's good to hear, frankly. Yeah. Were, you, were you a gymnast in your earlier life? Did you? Do I gym- was. I was a gymnast when I was young, so I I had that to fall back on. And my my, my younger daughter is a is a competitive gymnast, so I spend a lot of time in the gym. In fact, I wrote a lot of this book while sitting in the parent area of the gym. Oh, wow. um, so it's kind of nice to be surrounded by these incredible athletes and and to to kind of see that at work while I was writing about it. And so I think, but I think it was really helpful in understanding uh, just the physicality of gymnastics and the skills. I think that would be a hard one to fake if you didn't have some sort of basis in it um, to to really understand it. So why, why do you think you were drawn specifically to the story of Russian gymnast in the seventies? I know I would have been drawn to it because I, you know, was probably watching it on television at the time, but I think you're a little too young for that. Oh, that's kind of you. I also was watching them on television. Uh, I was, re- I found them really inspiring. I loved watching the Soviet gymnasts. I mean, I, I remember that feeling of, you know, back in the day that the American gymnasts were not at all on the same level. They were not, had not reached that, that level of, um, of gymnastics. And so the Soviets, I mean, they won eight straight Olympic gold medals in a row. You know, they were dominant beyond dominant. And I think they also had such a specific grace and style that we don't, we're never really going to see again. It was a very particular moment, very ballet heavy, but also innovative. And they had those very serious Soviet faces. And I just, I loved it. And so I, you know, as I was reminded when I, um, when you had Kevin Wilson on, he was talking about obsessions. And I think for me, this novel is very much about a bunch of my obsessions smashed together. So I, I was really interested in the Soviet Union. I studied Russian for a number of years. Um, wow. And then I read about this town that is, um, I'm somehow drawn, drawn to very inhospitable landscapes. But I was, I was really curious on how people live in a, in a place like this. And then the gymnastics and kind of put them all together. And it ended up, you know, kind of coming together for me for a novel. That's that awesome. So cool. It really like, is. What are my of... obsessions? Like, what am I going to put in a book? What am I going to like... <laughs> I know. It's good. I, it's good to think about. And it's also, I think, a bit of a relief to think. I, I, I will yeah. give you a small anecdote. My brother-in-law is a novelist. And he, um, when I got out of grad school, he had already published a novel and had a lot of success. And I went to his apartment and he had his whole entire wall was color-coded note cards. And I just sat back in utter panic because I don't... <laughs> right that way. And I thought, oh, no, this is how the successful people do it. Um, But I've kind of learned at least over the years that whatever, you know, my style works for me. And it's very much about kind of knowing the beginning and knowing the end and kind of working in that, you know, in that middle section. Sure. That's awesome. You know, it's funny, Ray, we um, on the show, we often ask for writing tips. And, and I feel like in 150 shows, we've gotten 150 completely different writing tips. Everyone has such a different way of doing it. So that's so yeah. interesting that you say that about your your brother-in-law. Yeah. Um, so in talking about this book, so you completed this book before the Russian invasion of Ukraine yes. last February. I mean, it's... Um, it, it, so it's just, it's, it's so yeah. relevant, like in a way that you probably couldn't have imagined when you were working on the book. No, definitely not. And I, I wasn't really thinking about it. And then I, I am obviously aware of Putin and kind of some, some things going on that were going on in Russia and this kind of his uh, talking about how he mourns the, the fall of the Soviet Union and these kind of things bringing back some of this, this stuff. And I think there's this, um, I've heard it said that if you, you scratch Putin and you find a Soviet, and I think that's really true that he yeah. came of age in the Soviet Union, he was in the KGB and all these things are in there and are, are kind of affecting the way that he is whatever he's doing. <laughs> um, so yeah, I did not foresee it. And, and it was, a, it's really, uh, it's, it shouldn't be that surprising, I think, because of the history of the, of that, of the country, but it still is surprising. That, that we're in this moment 30 years after the fall of the Soviet Union, and there are a lot of similarities that are still still there. Ab- absolutely. And it was, you know, it was hard for me not to think about that in, in reading your book. Do you, um, 
Do you think that the events going on in the world today will affect the way people read this book or will affect what people take out of it? Um, just in, in regard to, I mean, I, I know it takes place in the past, but maybe just in regard to the social dynamic or some of the, the culture of that part of the world. I think so. I mean, I, I will say that there was initially when, when it was kind of uh, after the invasion of Ukraine and there was this kind of, you know, Russia was, there was a bit of fear, not on the part of my publisher, but on, on the, some things that I heard that was like, you know, Russia's canceled. You don't want to write about right. Russia, even though this isn't a book that celebrates, yeah. you know, the goodness of it. But I do think it, it, it makes it feel a little more relevant in that yeah. things, you know, as we know, history is, is never dead. So it, it, yeah. I do think it brings it back up in a way, which is, I think nice. I think it's good. It, it makes it a little more um, connects it to how we are living right now. Well, you know, I also think there's just something about understanding the past better in order to understand the present better. And and then to know, you know, to sort of see our way into the future. And I feel like this book was something that educated me a little bit just about maybe the way people lived or the way people thought or just things I hadn't really thought as much about before. So I, I actually found it really relevant and really educational in, in terms well, thank of you. just That's thinking nice. about the current situation. But I think, it, yeah, no, I think it's true. And I think even though... I, it, 30 years to me doesn't seem like a long time. I think it's a, you know, it's a generation away yeah. and they're, 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 it, it is, feels past for younger people. It doesn't feel like, yeah. you know, I grew up in the cold war. So I, that's familiar to me, but it's not familiar to kind of a younger set. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That's fascinating. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it is just interesting how things like that happen, you know, how the universe is sort of, <laughs> you put something totally. out there. It's just always working. Yeah, totally. uh, well, I was struck in reading this book by how foreign Anya's life felt to me, but then in many ways, specifically in terms of her interior life, how familiar it felt. So can you talk a bit about crafting her character that way and what this blend of foreign and familiar meant to you? Oh, I like that. Yeah. You know, Anya, uh, she's not at all based on my daughter, but but my daughter was of similar age when I started and she was a serious gymnast. So I was kind of able to um, imagine gymnastics through her, but also give her credit for being more mature at times than we think of an eight-year-old. And Anya obviously feels older sometimes than eight, but I think that's partly because she's, she's motherless and she has a father that's not very uh, effective at the time um, and has to be in this, in this world. So I liked giving her agency where she doesn't have a lot of agency anywhere else. You know, she's at the mercy of the state and her coach and the gymnastic system. Um, but I, but I wanted her to feel, which I think is a legacy from her mother, but to feel that there is something that is hers alone and that, that she can, even within these very narrow boundaries, that she can have her own sense of something. And I think she needs that to be a great gymnast. I think you can put someone in this system who has talent and make them a good gymnast, but I don't think you can make them a great gymnast unless there is some sort of inner drive and inner fire to do that. Absolutely. I think that's so true. And that's so relatable in the story. I mean, anything from, you know, people who have played sports or been in that world before sure. can kind of understand that and relate to that. But then also we as writers, I mean, I think there's something oh. really, you know, yes. you can you can write a million beautiful books, but there's, you have to have that kind of grit to be able to get out there and get those rejection letters. And yeah. yeah. Well, and I think and also the belief in your works. project, you know, like you yeah. have to put yourself in there or it shows, I think, you know, I don't think you can churn out something without having a real personal sure. investment in it. Yes. Um, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I absolutely think you're right. And, you know, Ray, I, I also have to note before we let you go, I, I really, you've got the details of Russia just right. I, I mean, I, I read the book and then immediately went to look up your bio to see how long you had lived in Russia. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I, I was- compliment, yes, yes, thank you. Thank you. I was like, wait, she's, she's not 
part Russian or no, you just did such a good job evoking it all. So thank Ray, you. thank you so much for joining us. Oh my we gosh, hope- such a thrill to meet you all. Yeah, it's lovely. Well, thank you. This is but so we're, great. We're thrilled to have you here. We're thrilled the book's out in the world and we hope that our um thank you. That our viewers tonight will pick it up because it's it's a great novel and it'll teach them something about the past and about the world today. So great. congratulations and thanks thank for you being so with much. us. Yeah, thank you. Yay. All right. Thank you all. We'll oh my see. gosh, thank you. And yeah. everyone out there, that is it for us. We want to thank all of you once more for being members of this community, which is so special to all of us. We still cannot quite believe that there are 100,000 of you, 101,000 of you now hanging out with us. And we could not Amazing. be happier or more honored. It, it's it's incredible. We're just, we, we're pinching ourselves, right? So thanks to all of you for all you do to make Friends in Fiction such a warm, special place. We'll see you back here next Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Eastern for our Christmas special with Debbie McCumber and Wade Rouse. Until then, have a great week and happy reading. Good night.